everybody to tonight's live stream worship for Left Hand Church Community. I'm Heather Lynn, your worship minister. Pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I believe that we've always got time for love because all the times are times for love. Yes? <laughs> it is good to remember that we, each and every one of us, are loved exactly as we are. And the divine eyes of love don't look at us through rose-colored glasses, um, but sees us completely, absolutely every part of us. And nothing about us negates the good stuff. Yes, nothing about us, even the shadows, even our struggles, even the things that uh, we might not be proud of about ourselves. The divine sees so much beauty and so many reasons to believe in you and me. So let's reflect on that as we sing together, Beautiful to Me. Daffodils in winter 
You're the stream that feeds the river. You are. You are everything that's beautiful, bright and bold and true. Won't you trust me now? You're everything I need. I know all the things you try to hide, and maybe you would be surprised. But you're everything that's beautiful, bright and bold and true. Won't you trust me now? You're everything that's beautiful to me. sink deeply into our brains, our hearts, the cells of our bodies, that we are someone worth believing in every single day, no matter where we are at in our journey. Amen? Right. Amen. Come on. Amen. <laughs> yes, it is so good to be with you. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here. My pronouns are he, him, and his. We are so blessed to have this kind of weather today and to be able to do this outside. Um, we are we are very blessed. Um we are blessed for another reason. Uh, as some of you know, um, we've had some staff changes here with Jen's resignation. And so Christy Sykes and I have been uh, running around on fire because we've been really, really, really busy. And um, Nicole Vicky raised her hand and said, hey, guys, I would love to help. And we are so grateful for Nicole for raising her hand and coming on to help us uh, on, an, on an interim basis um, with some of our community uh, outreach and, and whatnot. So I want to in introduce to everyone Nicole Vicky. Woo! Come on in. Cool. John, for giving me a chance to introduce myself. Um, I'm going to use notes because I'm not a natural speaker. Um, I'm Nicole. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I started attending Left Hand last summer, so I'm a relative newbie. My family and I moved here in 2019. We've moved a lot for school and jobs and family, but I have some pretty deep Colorado roots. My grandparents actually met on the CU Boulder campus when my grandfather's fraternity invited my granny's sorority down from oh. the University of Washington for a dance. And the rest, they say, is history that resulted in me, you know, like being alive. So go Buffs. <laughs> <laughs> that is so sweet. No place we've ever moved has felt more like home so quickly. And y'all have been a huge part of that. I wanna say a big thank you to Sarah Clark and her family for stepping out on what was a really new friendship limb to invite our family to attend Left Hand last year. Um, I'll be honest, our family is a little bit of a theological mixed bag. I grew up with a Roman Catholic father and a Unitarian Universalist mother, or what I like to call a really nice blend of burning incense and burning questions. <laughs> nice. My husband is an active part of the Unity Spiritual Center in Denver, and we have two children who are growing into their own beliefs, 15-year-old Elle and 10-year-old Beck. The moment that I read our ethos for the first time, I knew that this space could hold our whole mixed bag, and I'm really grateful for that. <laughs> um, I raised my hand to help Christy and John through this summer because I knew that they would need help. Um, the company that I run is pretty much shut down right now due to COVID, so it's also been an honest blessing for me to have a good pile of work to work on. I'm helping specifically with communications, branches coordination, and a little bit of pastoral care. And here's what I want you to know about me. You can come to me with anything. Big feelings, big ideas, hurts, questions, cons concerns, um, offers to help, and requests for help. 
I want you to know that in my life, I have weathered things like divorce, serious illness in my immediate family, the loss of a close family member way too young, um, sexual assault, economic hardship, and chronic pain. I've also been deeply privileged to experience the joys of being married for 20 years, being a mother for almost 16, completing our family via adoption, 20 years of building and running startups, supporting people dearest to me in the world and living the truth of their sexuality, learning to become a strong ally for my young black son, and so much more. And I share all of that in hopes that some of you might recognize something on that list from your own path, and maybe something that I've learned along the way can serve you, or maybe serve as a starting point for us to learn from each other. Living in community to me means that we multiply our joys and we divide our pains, and I'm here to multiply and divide with you anytime. You can reach me at Nicole at lefthandchurch.org. And now I'll read that ethos that holds us all. Married, divorced, and single here, it's one family that mingles here. Conservative and liberal here, we've all got to give a little here. Big and small here, there's room for us all here. Doubt and believe here, we all can receive here. LGBTQ plus and straight here, there is no hate here. Woman, non-binary or man, here, everyone can here. Whatever your race here, for all of us, grace here. In imitation of the ridiculous love Almighty God has for each of us and all of us, let us live and love without labels. Ah, beautiful. Thank you for sharing parts of your story with us, too. It's good to get to know you better and what shapes your heart. Let's take a moment to maybe quiet our minds and our bodies, take a deep breath. And as we sing this beautiful, simple song that Pamela, our friend Pamela, wrote for uh, us, you know, I think of these words as how God comes to us, how Christ comes to us, and also the intentions that we can set for how we approach one another. So may this song be part of the pulse of our hearts and our being together. Grace 
that you need. God, we are so grateful that you come to us with open hearts, with love in your eyes, with arms so outstretched, none of us could really possibly imagine how wide that love is, how unconditional it is. Thank you for being the grace that we need. Pray that wherever we are right now, however we're feeling right now, whatever we're dealing with right now, that you would let the truth of your abiding love, the reality of your presence that never goes away, make yourself real to us, God, and make yourself real through us. Make your open heart your loving eyes, your outstretched arms, the grace that our world is so longing for. Make all of those parts of you real in us and through us. Here we are, seeking to surrender to your love and your grace as much as we possibly can. And where we are unable to, we trust you'll fill in the gaps and make up for it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. What other response could there possibly be? Just thank you and help and wow. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. So peace to you and yours, friends, in the midst of all the things, peace. Let's greet one another in the comments and share peace and love with one another. Virtual and consensual hugs always. <laughs> Can't wait to get back and hug one another. And feel free to share this video too if you want to on your Facebook page or start a watch party or something fun like that. Um, what's something fun we could share about each other in the comments? Like your favorite show this week or your favorite book? Sure. Okay. I'm looking at John because for some reason John likes to come up with those things. I'm like, he's the person for that. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everyone. So my name's Paula. She, her, hers. I think my favorite book probably is Wendell Berry's novel, Jaber Crow. Mm, about a guy who grows up in Kentucky and becomes the town barber mm. and has the, the most incredible, gracious, merciful intelligence and strength mm. that, um, that I knew from my grandfather and other similar men from that part of eastern Kentucky. Wow. People of the land, Scots-Irish people. Wow. And very proud people. Mm -hmm. And the men were not people of many words. Mm -hmm. Even my grandfather spoke three, four words a year, whether it was required <laughs> or not. And so much, Jaber Crow, just mm -hmm. reminds me of, of my grandfather and my father, mm -hmm. who I just lost um, mm -hmm. two weeks ago tomorrow. So sorry for that, Paula. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was 96, mm -hmm. so I think he gets to go and be with mom. He lived a good long life. He did. was Great a wonderful man. Mm -hmm. yeah. So glad. So, you know, we talk about love, and we talk about the fact that we as a church are so based in love. I love that quantum physics has discovered that the only ultimate reality is relationships. Mm -hmm. It could be defined as a pattern of relationships between non-material entities, that those are the building blocks of the universe. And so if the only ultimate reality is relationships, how much further is it to say that we live in a universe based on love? Mm -hmm. Certainly, it was Jesus' last answer to the last public question he was ever asked, which of the laws are the greatest. He said to love God, to love your neighbor, and to love yourself. And as I've said so many times, you can't do the first two if you can't do the third. Loving yourself is not all that easy. And we want to talk this evening about someone who learned to love himself, though it was a little bit later in life and not through the easiest of circumstances. Loving ourselves is not generally something we actually choose to do. It's something life forces us to do. So his name was Jacob. He was the younger of two twins. Esau was his brother. And because of the laws back in that day, even though Esau was just a few minutes older, 
He's the one who got two-thirds of the family inheritance. Jacob didn't like that. Evidently, neither did his mother, Rebecca, because she worked with him to go ahead and trick the brother and the father into giving that two-thirds of the family inheritance to Jacob. Esau found out about that and decided he wanted to kill his brother, at which point Rebecca, their mother, thought to herself, that might not have been the brightest thing I've ever done. And so she brings Jacob aside and said, I, I think you probably ought to leave maybe for a while. Why don't you go to the land of Haran, where my brother Laban lives, and you can stay there for, I don't know, how about 20 years until your brother's anger is gone. And so he goes to live in the land of Haran with his uncle Laban and promptly falls in love with Laban's youngest daughter, Rachel. Now, this was, in fact, his first cousin, if you're just, you know, with on all of those things. And, of course, back in this day, that really wasn't the thing it would be today. And so Laban was really a lot like Jacob, pretty Machiavellian. The end justifies the means. Well, sure, you can have her if you'll work for me for seven years first. Seems fair to Jacob, so he works for seven years. They have a big, giant wedding celebration. Everybody gets good and drunk. He goes to the wedding tent. His father-in-law sends his beloved bride in, and when he wakes up the next morning, finds out he actually did not sleep with Rachel, he has slept with her older sister, Leah. Which is not exactly what he had in mind. So he goes to his father-in-law and says, yeah, that was a bit of a trick. And Laban says, yeah, well, you know, the oldest child gets married first around here. What can I tell you? But you can have Rachel, too. And kind of interesting that no one's asking Leah what she thinks about all of this. Kind of a patriarchal society, don't you think? So he says, you can have Rachel, too, but you're going to have to work for me for seven more years. But I'll tell you what, I'm such a magnanimous fellow that I'll go ahead and give her to you on the installment plan. That way you can have both wives and you work for me for seven more years. And so he did. And six years beyond that, and finally it's time to go. So he works out this separation agreement, really quite a golden parachute as he's ready to leave Laban, where he's been for the last 20 years in the land of Haran. But his wife decides that what they're taking is not enough. She wants more. So she takes the family's gods. Now, their gods are little golden figures, kind of like um, precious moments figures, only different because they're made of gold. And so they steal these, plus a whole lot of other things, pretty much everything but the kitchen sink, and take off. And Laban finds out everything that's gone, takes off with his sons. He's going to kill Jacob. Now, let's just stop and think about all of these people. First, you've got Jacob and his mother in cahoots to steal away their brother and son's proper inheritance. Then you've got the brother angry enough that he's going to kill his brother over a third of the family inheritance. I mean, I understand being angry, but killing your brother? So he gets to Laban, who's also Machiavellian, in justifies the means. He marries Rachel. Rachel apparently turns out to be quite the thief. She won't even see her father when the father comes to try to negotiate some of his things to come back. All of these people are a mess. None of these people are nice. They are all just one big mess. And God says to Laban and his sons, yep, nope. You cannot kill Jacob, because here's the thing. I love him. I love all of them. I love all of you. All of you with your big, giant messes, I love you. So leave my child Jacob alone. So Laban goes home. Jacob, Rachel, all the other wives, all the animals, everything he's got, they head back toward home. And then Jacob thinks to himself, oh, yeah, my brother who wanted to kill me. So I need to tell my brother I've done well because he thinks this will impress his brother. So he sends servants off. Tell my brother I've done well. The servants come back. Yeah, your brother really doesn't care if you've done well. He's on his way here with 400 fighting men. To which Jacob thinks, I will buy my brother's peace. I will give him female camels and their young. I will give him cows. I will give him sheep and goats. And, you know, don't you think that more than likely if your brother's coming with 400 fighting men that he probably has done okay for himself and doesn't really want any of these things? What he wants is your blood. And finally, finally, he's ready to love himself. We don't come to God when we, when we see the light. We come to God when we feel the heat. He sees 
that it's time to love himself. But the kind of tough love that makes you grow up. And so the first thing he does is the first part of true self-love. There are four parts to true self-love. The first is accepting responsibility for your own actions. He takes all of his family, all of his goods, all of his animals, and takes them across the river Jabbok. And then he comes back alone to face his brother alone because he knows he's the one who created this problem and he's the one who has to accept responsibility for it. Finally, he's accepting responsibility for his own actions. You know, we as humans are kind of interesting because we have a tendency either to accept way too much responsibility for the problems that are in our lives or not enough responsibility for the problems that are in our lives. Now, there's a difference between a neurosis and a psychosis. A psychosis is when someone thinks that 2 plus 2 equals 5. So a psychosis is when you're out of touch with reality. You think 2 plus 2 equals 5. A neurosis is when you know 2 plus 2 equals 4, but it bothers you. And not only does it bother you, but you're pretty convinced that you're the reason that other people think 2 plus 2 equals 5. You accept way too much responsibility for the issues coming in your life. More of us are neurotic when it comes to things like that, and we accept too much responsibility for our problems. But there's a fair number of us that don't accept enough responsibility. Nobody's worse at that than people with narcissistic personality disorder who always see it as external. The truth is, in every disagreement, there are always truths on every side. Always. And the first thing he does is accept responsibility for his part in this problem. And he says, yes, I don't need to involve my family. I'm going to go and do this alone. And the second thing he has to do is examine himself stringently. And that's what he's doing when he comes back across the river and he's alone. And the evening is beginning to fall. He's looking deep inside his own heart. It's hard to do. So about six months ago, one of my friends came to me and was pretty angry about something I had done. Well, the truth is I had not done it. And so I said, yeah, well, I actually didn't do that. And the friend immediately was like, oh, okay. But still, I thought it was my responsibility to examine myself deeply because this was a friend who normally would not have thought something like that. And so I thought to myself, what am I doing that would cause them to think that? What have I done in my relationship with them that would cause them to think that? And as I began looking at it, I realized, oh, it's not just that they have stuff that they're dealing with, but I also have given them reason to think that. Of course, that's the only time that's ever happened in my life. In the last week, let's say, maybe it's happened again. It's hard to be open to stringent self-examination. But he is. He's willing to look hard at his own soul. And then he does the third thing that you have to do in self-love. He has to be open to challenge from the outside. He has to be willing to allow other people to come and tell him what his issues are. In his case, the person who comes from the other side is God himself. Let's take a look at it. It's in the book of Genesis. He's alone. Night has fallen. He's accepting responsibility for his own actions. He's stringently examining the contents of his own heart. And now he opens himself up to challenge from the outside. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, meaning could not overpower Jacob. He touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what's your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with... um, God, and with men, and have overcome. 
Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. He starts wrestling in the middle of the night with a man. We're told in another passage of scripture it was an angel. But he comes to realize the person he's wrestling with is God. He's wrestling with God. And as dawn comes, he realizes he could win the wrestling match. That God recognizes that Jacob might win the wrestling match. And here's the thing. You can win a wrestling match with God. You can. God doesn't force God's self on you. God doesn't force you to follow what God wants. You can win a wrestling match with God. The question is, is it a good thing? Is it a good thing to win a wrestling match when your opponent is the Lord of the universe? Wisely, Jacob recognizes in being challenged from the outside by God's self that he needs to lose this wrestling match with God. And he says, bless me. And what he doesn't know is he just got blessed already. That God blessed Jacob when he wrenched his hip from its socket. He blessed him when he defeated him. That was his blessing, his blessed defeat. Jacob's saying, give me a blessing, and God's like, okay. Well, then we'll rename you too, from Jacob to Israel. Because, my friend, you're not going to forget this. He's opened himself to challenge from the outside. He's going to walk with a limb for the rest of his days. And he knows he's wrestled with God and been defeated. It's the next morning. He moves on into the next phase of loving yourself, accepting responsibility for your own actions, intringent self stringent self-examination, openness to challenge from the outside, and a dedication to the truth, no matter how painful that truth might be. He will face his brother, and he will face the consequence, whatever it might be. And his brother shows up with all of his men and kills him. No, no, it's not a Bergman film, or a Fellini, or, well, it's not any film. It's our story. Because apparently Esau, too, has been defeated by God and has no interest in killing his brother. What he wants is a reconciliation. And the two of them, after 20 years of animosity, unite in the truth that we are all busted. So I think a lot of us at Left Hand, for the last three weeks, have felt like we're wrestling with God. All day, every day, wrestling with God. And we're weary. We're weary. And yes, we've been defeated. We've been defeated. We've been defeated. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Because now maybe we move forward with the humility and the wisdom that we need. So often I've been on my knees for the last nine months saying, God, what do you ask of me? And the answer is always consistently, well, you've got to love yourself, my friend. With that kind of love, you have to accept responsibility for your own actions, for the mistakes I've made. We all love John Jepson so much, and she loves this church and loves all of you. And I have to accept responsibility for the mistakes I've made that cause her to not be with us. It's not easy. 
I also have to do the stringent self-examination and say, what, what might I have done differently? I've watched as Christy and John and our LC and so many of you, so many of you I've talked with are doing the same thing. We all just want to get it right and so often we don't. And I want to be open to challenge from the outside. And I've already met with people and I'll be meeting with more of you. People who've let me know that often I've not been the pastor you needed me to be. I'm so, so sorry. Because I do believe the truth sets us free. Oh yeah, it makes us miserable first. But that's what gives us wisdom. And from wisdom comes hope, and from hope comes joy. You know, happiness comes where you expect it. Joy has a mind of its own. Joy can come in the midst of deep, great sorrow. I understand what Rilke was talking about in that great poem, The Man Watching. I can tell by the way the trees beat after so many dull days on my worried window panes that a storm is coming. And I feel the, f the far off fields say things I cannot bear without a friend I cannot love. I, I cannot love without my sister. The storm, the shifter of shapes drives on across the woods and across time. And the world looks as if it had no age. The landscape like a line from a songbook is seriousness and weight and eternity. What we choose to fight is so tiny. What fights us is so great. If only we would let ourselves be dominated, as things are by some immense storm, then we could become strong too, and not need names. When we win, it's with small things, and the triumph itself makes us small. I mean, the angel who appeared before the wrestler of the Old Testament, when the wrestler's sinews grew strong like metal strings, the angel, holy the angel, felt them under his fingers like chords of deep music. Whoever was beaten by that angel, ah, now why I love this poem, Whoever was beaten by that angel, though often the angel simply declined the fight, you can win a wrestling match with God. Whoever was beaten by that angel, though often the angel simply declined the fight, but whoever was beaten went away proud and strengthened and great from that harsh hand that needed him as if to change his shape. Winning pff, does not tempt that man. This is how he grows, by being defeated decisively by ever greater beings. God. And our defeat is your blessing as we try to pull ourselves together. May we love you love our neighbors, love ourselves, maybe with humility and wisdom, trust in the slow work of God. Amen. Pride and exaltation be the love, be the love. Hey, be the hope for the children's salvation, be the peace. For the nation's reconciliation Be the life that says yes to all creation Be the love Be the love oh, oh, oh. Destruction's always easier than creation 
Thank you, Paula. That was a beautiful message. My name is Christy, and I'm one of the pastors here at Left Hand, Ch Left Hand Church. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. This is a time when we break bread together and share wine. So if you would like to gather elements to uh, share communion with us, we would love to do that together with you. God encourages us to come, be still, and linger in love's presence. Together we breathe, and it is slow, gentle, and consistent. Here our pain is honored and our loss is acknowledged. Our struggles are not dismissed or inflated. It is in this place that we seek honesty, change, commitment, and compassion. Wherever you are in your journey today, know that God is embracing each one of us as we walk through this messy, tender, and beautiful existence together. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat in a room among his disciples to celebrate the annual Passover meal. He took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat and remember me. Later that same evening, he took the cup And after giving a blessing, he said, this wine is the blood of a new covenant, a promise for the redemption of all people. Take, drink, and remember me. If you would take the elements that you have today for our shared communion, let us remember that this is Christ's body broken for you and Christ's blood shed for you. Please pray with me. Dear God, you remind us over and over in your word that you are always with us. You tell us not to fear and you draw us close into your presence. You are the only place we find refuge in the storms that surround us right now. You are the only place we can find peace and strength. We ask you for your words of truth to give us endurance we need to get through these hard places. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you know the way we take and that you have a plan. We press in close to your presence today, and no matter what obstacles we're facing, please help us choose joy. Amen. I believe in your belonging here. I believe in our enduring messy love. We've 
got nothing to fear Whoever you are Whatever you have done From wherever you come We're in this together here Set each other free, forgive with unreserved grace. Hold a hand, shed your tears, believe in your belonging here. I believe in your I believe in our real and messy love. We've got nothing to fear. Whoever you are, whatever you have done, from where. We're in this together here, here in an infinitely wide embrace. Linger a while and don't make haste. We live and move and be, set each other free, forgive with unreserved grace. Hold a hand, shed your tears, believe in your belonging here. Hold a hand, shed your tears, believe in your belonging here. Thank you. That was beautiful. Uh, hi again. Um, <laughs> while Paula was giving her sermon today, uh, there was something that was going on sort of in the background that none of you watching could, could see. Because out of the corner of my eye, I spotted our two dogs running out from the house. And I see my beautiful wife chasing after the dogs. And she got in the, she got in the car because my dogs don't come if called. They only jump into a car if called. So literally, Paula's giving this beautiful, just, you know, rip open your heart sermon while there's like the Keystone cops are going on behind here looking, uh, looking for the dogs. But the good news is, is that the dogs were corralled and we got to listen to Paula's beautiful sermon. Um, I'm going to do announcements now. Uh, if you consider left hand, your home church and would like to be added to the left hand, uh, email list, uh, you can email me at, uh, John at lefthandchurch.org or Christy at lefthandchurch.org. Similarly, if you consider left hand sort of your physical home church, you can also, um, uh, be added to the left hand Facebook community page. And on that community page, we put a lot of information about some of the various events that we do. A couple of those are on Tuesdays at seven o'clock. There is a book study. It's just getting started. It's the book of Galatians. And so if you'd like to join, uh, I, I know that that group would love to have you. Similarly, Wednesdays at 630 on the left hand community Facebook page, uh, there is a prayer call that gets organized through that. 
Um, some other quick housekeeping on the branches program. Uh, we are, uh, at the request of, of several of the branches folks, we're going to consolidate the three Longmont branches into one giant branch. Is there a term for a, a tree branch? A limb. A what? A limb. A limb. Oh, a limb. <laughs> I'm like, a what? Um, <laughs> Maybe we'll call that the Longmont Limb. Uh, and uh, Julie Hatfield and Kate Gaddis uh, will co-lead that. I know that they're excited for some of that virtual fellowship. Um, last, we couldn't do this without uh, all of your financial support. Uh, I mean that. Uh, you can log on to lefthandchurch.org slash give for giving information. S uh, similarly, you can text any amount to 84321. What happens there is the first time you put in 84321 in a dollar amount, the uh, bank, you can put your credit card information in, and then it'll make sure that that money gets to us. And then going forward, whenever you just text an amount to that 84321, we will get it. So thank you for your support. We appreciate you. Thanks for, uh, mm, thanks for watching. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. You know, there's, it's, it's so weird. This is how we show up right now. Yeah. This is, so thanks for showing up in the ways that we can and making use of that. As we uh, wrap this time up together, uh, let's sing together, Love Be My Everything. When I first wrote this song, it was to be a meditation, a reflection, just asking love, the divine force of love that makes up all of life to infuse every aspect of my life, the good, the bad, the ugly, the in-between, um, the mundane, all of it. And, um, and it's tricky, right, to, to learn what that means, actually, because love is this abstract thing, but, but you know it when it's there, right? You know it when it's there. <laughs> you know when you're operating from love. You know when you're receiving love. And, um, and so may we ever increase our capacity through Christ to give and receive love no matter what state of being we find ourselves in. Amen. May love absolutely be our everything through it all. Compassion in these eyes 
your comings and all in all of your goings and all of your learning and all of your defeats and in all of your triumphs may you know that God who is love is your life your breath your being and absolutely never has any reason to give up on you friends go in love go with love and love abiding in you amen go in peace Compassion in these eyes, kindness in these hearts, in this crazy, crazy.